Shocking absolutely nobody, Variety announced that AMC will not be opening this weekend, instead waiting two more weeks for, I don't know, content? <laughs> Greetings all, thank you for watching these videos. This is Film Stuffs. So just a couple little tidbits before we get into the main bulk of the video, which I'll be talking about the future of movie theaters, what I think might happen. There's a cool barking dog out there. First, as I was uploading the video yesterday, Disney Pixar announced that uh, Soul will be dropped. I think sometime in November, the November this time. Also, like I said before, AMC is not opening because they got no reason to. So, I want to talk about the future of the movie theater. I don't know if anything that I'm about to say will actually come true. I am not a soothsayer. This is just me putting my ear to the ground and, 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 and feeling things out. If there's something big that I'm missing, please tell me. I would love to continue this conversation. I don't want this to be the last video that I make on this. I spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff, so I, I'm ready to share it with the world. I want to hear what everybody else has to say and what people are, are ready for. There's a couple of blanket statements I would like to make as we start. One, why all these release dates all of a sudden? My personal feeling on it, again, I have no idea if this is true whatsoever. It is a cynical thought, but we're entering a new financial quarter and shareholders need to hear something. And set release dates, I think, help stocks probably in the time being. As long as we announce it now, we can say, hey, we're actually, oh, we were wrong, things got worse, but we have intentions to make money. We can't right now. Uh, so that's my little theory on, on this. I think they need to pick these dates and then change them later because I don't think anything is going to stay the way that it is. That being said, maybe it will be fine. Maybe everything will just be fine by August 12th. We'll figure something out in a month. There'll be some major change and we'll all be able to go see Tenet together and cheer and laugh and have a great time. So that's my number two. I just want to say that maybe my cynicism is all for naught. And uh, hopefully it is. We can open up and um, everything will be fine. Something will have been figured out as things stand right now. Okay, so where do we start? The first option as far as I can tell, is the current timeline. Bing! Um, that means we open in August, they do the 30% capacity thing, all the employees have their temperatures taken, everyone's wearing masks, there's a limited menu, and everything that they announced with the Clorox partnership comes to fruition. That's one option. The other half of that is that there are modifications made, meaning there are 14 houses. Some of those houses have 1,200 seats. Take out half those seats. Have a 600 house, you know, when it's built. If you rip seats out and, give, and, and build the social distancing into the experience, I think AMC and Cinemark and Regal and all them could, have, could afford to do something like that. They own all this property. Does that mean that the ticket prices need to go up? Maybe. And that's basically all I can tell. We all go see Mulan, we all go see Wonder Woman, and basically the video that I put out yesterday comes the way we said, and this is, this is what happens. So that's, we'll call that option A. Option B would be the one house transformation. What this means is there are theaters in our towns that we are used to being live stages. In my hometown of Burlington, Vermont, we have the Flynn Theater. Um, here in Chicago, we have the Chicago Theater. All of these theaters were originally movie palaces. M multiplexes came in, destroyed it to keep these beautiful buildings alive. They became uh, live venues. So. The idea is those buildings are built for social distancing. 
in a way. Not really right now, the way we pack the house for a, for a concert. But I know that the Chicago Theater is built for the Chicago International Film Festival. They often start their festival and end their festival there. So it's, it's made, you can still watch movies in these wonderful old palaces. When I was a kid, my parents took me to go see Charlie Chaplin movies at the Flynn Theater. Uh, with a live orchestra. My dad took me to see a acid jazz version of the 3D creature from the Black Lagoon that was at the Flynn Theater. So they're really fun experiences. It's a way to keep it alive. People love cheering together. It's something that we're going to have to figure out and reconcile with all this, that we as a species really love gathering in large groups and, and feeling something together. I watched... Avengers movies from the porthole upstairs I could hear people cheering and laughing when we had Get Out the scene at the end when Lil Ray shows up would shake the theater I would be up in the manager's office and people cheering and laughing would shake it physically shake my office it was amazing what an amazing thing that's what i'm so romantic for and what we're looking to get back to but i just i don't know how we're going to get back to it anytime soon so we talk about taking the chicago theater i don't know what the live situation is going to be some really wonderful theaters have just shut down the mercury theater in Chicago had to shut its doors. The Metro in Chicago had to shut its doors. You know, it's been suggested to me that once we enter new phases, once cures come along, we'll, we'll save the Metro. I saw so many shows there. But until then, why not take a house that's built for 2,000 people that you can't sell your live show to because of all this and, and make it so that 300 people can go see Tenet on a big screen, really separated from each other. Does this help the corporate movie theaters or the independent theaters? No, but if live theaters and big palaces are having a hard time, I don't see why they wouldn't start trying to figure this one out because they can also charge X amount, you know, to sit in a nice seat. I don't, depending on the seats, <laughs> you know. Would it be fun to spend 15 bucks so I could see Batman at the Chicago Theater, that sounds pretty fun. We're lucky here in Chicago, there's a lot of cool theaters like that. The Uptown's been sitting vacant for a really long time. That can hold 3,500 people. Um, it was the top of the theater experience in its day, where it's sitting in uh, Broadway and Lawrence in Chicago. At the time, where the Green Mill is, where Al Capone used to hang out, it was basically uh, there was a time where it was like Times Square, the Times Square of Chicago. I mean, the Aragon's right there, the Riviera's right there, Uptown's right there, the Mill is right there. It's where I saw Tenacious D and Ween. There's, a, there's an old elegance to that experience. It's one of the reasons why I love going to the music box is because it feels like what it felt like to go see a movie in the 30s. The sound is a certain way, the seats are a certain way, and it feels like I'm transported to this time where I could, this is how people watch films. It's really, really interesting. It's a totally different experience than watching something at an AMC. Will I say that it's better or worse? Absolutely not. They're two completely different things. Option C. Collapse and rebuild. Raise the earth and start anew. This is a timeline where the current ownership of theaters kind of lose everything. And so the people with money have to maintain the experience. There's a Amazon bookstore in Wrigleyville, which I think is hilarious because it seems like the ultimate F you like Amazon is the reason why there aren't that many is one of the reasons there aren't that many, uh, physical brick and mortar bookstores but they can afford to have one themselves. The other thing is that the Paramount Decree is in jeopardy right now. I'm not sure how far along we are into this process, and I don't even know if that's what it's called, but back in the 50s, the breakup of the major studios, Paramount Pictures owned Paramount Theaters. 20th Century Fox owned Fox Theaters. You could make movies and put them out, distribute them exactly for yourself. 
there came uh, an antitrust, like anti-monopoly thing where people said, that's not legal anymore. You can't do that. Paramount's not allowed to own a theater. That's why there are separate theaters. Since the current presidency, I'm to understand that this is all in jeopardy and that uh, that may no longer exist. So major companies may be able to build brick and mortar theaters, much like each company is now building their own digital store. Disney Plus, HBO Max, Apple TV, Netflix. If it all goes through, there's no reason why there wouldn't be Netflix theater, Google theater, Apple theater. And then the Hollywood studios would be forced to deal with these guys, which right now they're, they're trying to act like they have the upper hand, but it feels like they're swimming against a tidal wave. More power to them. Hey everybody, say hi. Say hi. Little man. <laughs> so I'd be curious to see what that world looks like. I'm not going to say I'm excited for it. I think it's exciting to see how actively the studios in Hollywood is fighting against giving Netflix an Oscar. Um, they gave Amazon an Oscar, but it didn't seem to have as big of a splash. One of the best things that happened to Hollywood was Parasite coming in and, and legitimately earning uh, Best Picture. If the streaming companies own brick and mortar theaters, all bets are off. D is landmark status, which is kind of taking B and C and um, making a baby. Basically, Netflix or a major company buys the Chicago theater the same way I think Chase bought the Chicago theater. Um, one of the theaters in Chicago is connected with um, one of the schools. And that's how they make a lot of their bread and butter. That's how they stay alive. Landmark status is really important because then we all have to work around the landmark and not justify our existence. So that's a way that things could happen. If my theater turned into a landmark, we wouldn't have to worry as much about things. Um, but also it's not as easy to do that as it might think, um, depending on the percentage of your building and rebuild and how much is the original building. Um, so if a major company bought a theater to keep it alive, that's a way for everything to keep alive. So that's the landmark idea. That would be D. And then of course, E is drive-ins. Drive-ins making a huge comeback right now. And that's really exciting. I'm lucky enough. My hometown has a drive-in. I've had a drive-in my entire life next door. It's something that I could do for my birthday go see, um, I remember I saw the Mark Wahlberg Planet of the Apes, followed by Jet Li's Kiss of the Dragon. There was always a double feature. There still is always a double feature. My dad just saw Garth Brooks live at the drive-in. Um, it's a really fun idea. It's a way to social distance. It's a big screen. I need to know how these guys are making money. I'm to understand the drive-in at my home has a piece of paper, you can tick things off and then people with masks deliver the snacks to you, which is a fun idea and, and that works. You charge by the car, you, uh, I, you know, everything is by radio now. I wonder how it works with Bluetooth. We can continue um, evolving the drive-in, which who would have thought? Um, the thing about the drive-in in my hometown is that there is a motel owned by the same guy that's on the property. It's kind of like Brad Pitt and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So if you get one of those rooms, you can watch the movies. I have a feeling that that's how he makes his scratch. Um, and he can keep that motel open all year. The drive-in is a wonderful thing. The sustainability of the drive-in is, is something else. It'll be a lot easier in a place where there's no snow where I'm from has snow, so it's a seasonal treat. Um, I also saw Brad Pitt's Troy there, and it wasn't, I don't know what the follow-up was supposed to be, but we definitely drove over and watched Thomas Jane and John Travolta in The Punisher. I slept through that. So I'm curious to see where the drive-in's gonna go. I'm not crazy about it because it's a very, um, there was always a lot of things that went along with going to the drive-in. 
namely bugs, namely tailgaters. So the drive-in is a fun experience, but it isn't quite the same experience as going to a theater. Um, if you sit in your car, it can be really comfortable, but there's glass between you and the screen. Um, we used to pull the car around and open up the back and set up all the mosquito things, but then, you know, you also get the sound of everybody around and it, I don't know if you go to the drive-in to see a movie that you really care about. You tell me. I would love to know your thoughts. It's really, that's another one that's like a really romantic idea and really, really fun. And then the more I think about it, I'm like, I do it. But is that how I want my main source of watching? Is that my movie theater experience? Is the drive-in? Maybe. I don't know. And then the final one, F, is the speakeasy. What's the speakeasy? Basically, illegal movie watching, which again is fun and romantic and stupid. And it doesn't actually solve any of the issues that I addressed in any previous video. So I can understand how that's appealing, but also that's not a viable anything. And you might as well just open up theaters proper. Until then, the whole streaming thing is fascinating. I don't know who can afford to have all of these different subscriptions, so it's gonna come to a reckoning. You're gonna have to be able to pick one or the other. Pirating is gonna get out of control. Um, or we'll finally make my invention, the backpack. It'll be like orbits, but for these movie subscriptions. Get a group deal and you can pick the subscriptions that you want and everything will be on one platform. Please, if you wanna invest in that, hit me up. My God, I've been talking about this for a long time. Backpack. Right now it's a question of why, why bother with theaters? Especially if they're not gonna be renegotiating box office prices. The studios take so much box office, the theaters don't really see anything. Theaters see between five and like 20% of what's made from movie tickets. That's why you need to buy popcorn. That's what keeps the roof on because tickets is not enough. Tickets have never been enough. If Disney Plus can just skip all that and make all the money, if Trolls 2 can just drop on Amazon and make $100 million in a weekend, it was not going to make that at my theater. Trolls 2 was going to make 20 to 30 or that's optimistic. And the fact that it came out when it did, how it did. I'm to understand that this Eurovision movie with Will Ferrell, big deal, one of his most successful in a long time, just different metrics for all of that. I don't really know how to gauge it because they're not letting me read. You know, it used to be you get money from a box office and that's how you see how well a movie does. Now everything has its own metrics. And if you have your own distribution arm, if everyone has HBO in coming into your house anyway, why wouldn't you make your deal with HBO instead of having to deal with an intermediary? Movie theaters are going to want Bloomhouse movies. And if Bloomhouse is just going to go straight to Amazon, oh my god, Universal will be done with theaters forever. Because why wouldn't they just keep all that scratch for themselves? Let me know what I missed. Please, I would love to do another one of these. Um, let me know if you have any questions, all this business. What is the song today? Do What You Gotta Do by Nina Simone. Wanna cry a little? Wanna sing a little? Wanna feel a little? Do what you gotta do. The book, I got my bookshelf right here now. Walter Murch's In the Blink of an Eye. If you are into editing, Walter Murch is the guy who edited all the Godfather movies. The Conversation, American Graffiti. He also did Ghost, The Talented Mr. Ripley, and The English Patient. Walter Murch is one of the greatest editors of all time. The things that he has to say are fascinating. This book, the first chunk of it, was a speech that he gave. It's more of the philosophical way of looking at editing. It's not a how-to, it's just a different way to think about it. I've read this book a couple of times. I edit a lot. It's a, it's a great way to learn about emotion and feeling through editing. It's wonderful. The movie of the episode, 
Stony Island. Oh, I love this movie. It's a 1970s independent film shot in Chicago. The director of The Fugitive. Uh, I believe his name is Andrew Davis. Is that true? This movie means a lot to me. My movie Scrapers was very much influenced the the look of it. The filmmaker saw Mean Streets and said, I want to do one of those too, but about my home. It's about Chicago, but it's a musical. And I just, it's one of my favorite stories. The music is really, really good. Definitely watch Stony Island if you get a chance. It's a, a real joy. Check out Captain's Chair. It's a short that I wrote and shot and cut. It's directed by BBF Productions and starring Taylor Shepard and Grant Whitaker. I love this short. You might like it too. I'll put the link below. That's that. Why do birds suddenly appear over there, over here?